النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاها ما بعد So we are continuing insha'Allah ta'ala with uh, part two of Khadija radiallahu anha and uh, last time I believe I had reached uh, where did I reach? The issue of her age during marriage, correct? That was where I'd reached that, how old she was during marriage. So uh, I had also mentioned that it seems like she had hired the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a business trip to uh, Syria. And uh, there's also one report that she might have even done this twice. And if that is the case, then uh, we can derive from this that she was a mature, wise lady who is testing the Prophet ﷺ twice before making such a big decision. So the marriage of Khadija, as we said, occurred when the Prophet ﷺ was 25 years old. And it was at that point in time where the Prophet ﷺ finally had a house of his own because before this point in time, he was simply living in the house of Abu Talib So Abu, Ta- Abu Talib, uh, I said radiallahu he didn't die a Muslim, my apologies. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ moved out of the house of Abu Talib and he moved into the house of Khadija and this is where he lived for the rest of his Meccan period. So he never had a separate house from those two. He grew up in Abu Talib's house and then he lived in the house of Khadija until the uh, Hijrah. And in the house of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, there were other people that were either they were brought in after the marriage or they were living from before. So very quickly we'll talk about some of the uh, the people who were there or who, whom the union brought together. So obviously with Khadija would be who right now? We already mentioned this last week. Her son. Okay, Hind. And as I said, strangely enough, we don't have many reports, but he must have been there. Now, along with that, there were two other people, both of whom were former slaves, and eventually they were freed. The one of them from the side of Khadija, and the other from the side of the Prophet Wasallam. So on the side of the Prophet Wasallam, uh, he had a khadima, a slave, by the name of Barakah. And her kunya was Ummi Ayman. Baraka, her kunya was Ummi Ayman. And of course, I have given a brief story of Baraka before. And just a brief summary as well that Baraka, remember who she was? She was actually the slave of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet. And according to one report, she might actually have been one of the children of the army of Abraha, whose father died, and so she's taken a prisoner. Okay, so she's coming with the army of Abraha, and that would make perfect sense, it fits in perfectly. So, Ummi Ayman is a little girl, in all likelihood her father has been martyred or you know, killed or whatever in the, in the uh, attack of the Kaaba, and so obviously they're going to be prisoners of war, they're going to be taken, and so she's sold, sold into slavery, and Abdullah, the Prophet's father, acquires her. How old is she? We have not a single clue about her age other than what we can derive and extract. And so this is all my ijtihad and Allah knows best that the only reasonable age that we can have is she is older than the Prophet ﷺ by a few years, at max five years. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense the rest of the story. Okay, So she is basically a little girl. And that's not uncommon. I know it sounds strange, but that's not uncommon back in the day to have a child you know, in that circumstance. It was pretty common and normal. And so she is a young lady, a young girl, who is basically going to be raised as a slave. Uh, and uh, when the process is, is born, she might have been maybe five years old, six years old. So she's just a little bit older than the Prophet Wasallam. So she accompanies Amina to Mecca, and the process is six years old. So she's going to be 11, 12 years old. Okay, Amina dies on the way back. She is the one that brings the Prophet back to Mecca. So this makes sense now. And obviously, she's not going to be alone in the desert. Obviously, they're going with a caravan, but each caravan has many units. So that unit was Amina and Barakah and the Prophet, and so Amina dies. So she continues with the caravan back to uh, Medina, back to Mecca, and. With the death of Amina, she then becomes the property of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she essentially raises the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a motherly figure, even though she's only a few years older than him. And that is why in some books of, of Sirah, and these are not 
hadith in Sahih Bukhari Muslim. These are books from the seerah, and there's no problem in narrating them. That uh, the Prophet would say whenever he saw her, Ya Ummah, O my mother. Ya Ummah. So he would call Ummi Ayman, O my mother. And it is also mentioned that uh, she had a problem pronouncing Arabic. And I mentioned some stories before that she had either a lisp or a pronunciation issue, one of the two, that she couldn't pronounce Arabic properly. And sometimes she would say things that mean other than what is intended, uh, such as, for example, when she said, Thabbata Allahu akhdamakum. So instead of saying Thabbata, she said Sabba, which is cursing, rather than Thabbata, which means to, uh, to affirm. So the Prophet said, enough of this dua, enough of this dua. We don't need this dua. Even though it was a joke, she didn't mean it that, but the point is like that. So she had that um, talking, maybe most likely it was a, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to learn the Arabic pronunciation when you're coming from another culture. Allah knows best. So this is um, uh, Baraka. Her kunya was Ummi Ayman. And of course, Ummi Ayman, uh, well, wh- how did she get the kunya? Because she married uh, one of the uh, people of Mecca uh, who was actually not from the Quraysh. He was a traveler or a resident, and his name was uh, Ubaid al uh, Ayman ibn Ubaid al Khazraji. Uh, uh, sorry, Ubaid al Khazraji. And Ubaid al Khazraji married uh, Baraka, and the two of them had Ayman. So that's where we get Ummi Ayman. Okay, they had this Sahabi called Ayman, and Ayman does have a few reports in the seerah, but he dies a shaheed uh, in the battle of Hunayn, so he dies within the Meccan, uh, the Medinan seerah. He dis- dies within the seerah time frame, so there's no children of that, and he dies basically a shaheed uh, in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. So, uh, Baraka's husband, Baraka's husband dies, she becomes a widow. And the Prophet ﷺ then says, whoever wishes to marry a lady from Jannah, let him marry Ummi Ayman. So he is encouraging people to marry Ummi Ayman. And this is where our next figure comes in. And that is a figure that was belonging to Khadija, but was gifted to the Prophet ﷺ. And that is none other than, you all know, Zayd. Zayd. Zayd ibn Haritha, Zayd ibn Haritha, right? Zayd ibn Haritha. So Zayd ibn Haritha, the story again, I've done this before many, many, actually a year or two ago, I forgot when. Zayd ibn Haritha was an Arab slave, and that was a little bit rare, but the story was that he was kidnapped as a child, and he was sold into slavery, uh, and eventually he made his way to the souk of Ukalv outside of the, the Haram during the, the pilgrimage, and Khadija told her nephew, Hakim ibn Hizam, who we talked about last week, she told Hakim ibn Hizam that I'm going to get married to Muhammad, so find me a bright young you know, slave that I can gift to him. And again, all of this is common back then, as the days of Jahiliya, slavery is rampant, no problem there in understanding what's going on. And she wants to give a gift to her husband of a khadim, of a servant, and he's going to be helping out and whatnot. So she instructed Hakim ibn Hizam to get a young lad, a young boy to do khidma of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is where Zayd ibn Haritha comes into the uh, picture. And so Zayd is now also in the household and Baraka is in the household. When the Prophet marries Khadija, either at that time or shortly after that time, uh, the marriage takes place between uh, Baraka and between Ubaid al-Khazraji, the, the first of her husbands. At some point in time, Ubaid passes away. We don't know exactly when. That's when the Prophet says, whoever wants to marry a lady from Jannah, let uh, him marry uh, Ummi Ayman. And so Zayd proposes for Ummi Ayman because they know each other very well. They have both been living in the same house. They have both been slaves at one point in time uh, to uh, the Prophet and to Khadija. And so they both are very familiar with one another. And Zayd, therefore, for proposes to Ummi Ayman and they then get married even though from the standards of the time Ummi Ayman was quote unquote beneath Zayd in the sense of social status, ethnic status, you know what I'm talking about in the Jahiliya days, you know she wasn't known for her beauty, she was not a lady that would have been, uh, uh, you know people who are superficial would have been interested in, on top of that she must have been at least 10, most likely 15 years older than Zayd, if you think about the math and do them. So most likely even there's a 15 year age gap between Zayd and between uh, Ummi Ayman. Still, Zayd proposes because he wants a lady from Jannah. And because he must have known her from living in the household. And so her akhlaq and her 
uh, mannerisms attracted uh, Zayd to her. And so they marry and they remain married until Zayd dies a Shaheed in the battle of Mu'tah, in the battle of Mu'tah, the eighth year of the Hijrah, the famous, the tragedy that happens. So the two of them remain married and from that union is born. So literally they are married in the house of Khadija. They live in the house of Khadija. She gives birth in the house of Khadija. And this is why this family is a very special family and it's linked to the Prophet and Khadija directly because they are living there and they are servants and then they are freed eventually as you know I did the story that both of them were eventually freed. But even when they're freed they remain with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they remain as a part of the extended family if you like and Usama Ibn Zayd is born Usama Ibn Zayd was called the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so this is one family that is a part and parcel of the family of Khadija and the Prophet Sallallahu from the very uh, beginning and uh, of course, uh, the other uh, person that eventually comes into the family, at what stage exactly, we don't know, but most likely around five to seven years before the beginning of the prophethood, which means around seven, six years after the marriage of Khadija. So not immediately after the marriage of Khadija, but maybe five, six years after the marriage of Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ then offers his uncle Abu Talib, why don't you give me your youngest boy now? At the time that was Ali ibn Abi Talib, okay? Uh, Ja'far uh, was older, too old, doesn't need to be uh, any help. So why don't you give me your youngest boy and I will raise him? Because socioeconomically, the Prophet is now wealthier than his uncle because of Khadija. And there's more space in the house and uh, Abu Talib is a very, very impoverished family, very struggling family. And so Ali radiallahu anh, moves in to the household of Khadija. So if you look at it, the house of Khadija is a house of love and joy. It's a house of lots of people. It's not an empty house. Even now the children are going to come. That's another thing. But subhanAllah, it's like the bustle, the hustle and bustle and the barakah that comes. It's very clear that the house of Khadija would have been a relatively larger house and there would have been, you know, many rooms and whatnot and they're all living uh, their life over there. And the next 15 years, i.e. from uh, the marriage until the beginning of Wahi, we do not have really any information at all. We don't have much information about their personal lives because obviously, who's going to narrate? It's a personal life between the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, Khadija. So we literally just have one or two things and the main thing that we have is really the children that were born to them. And I've gone over uh, the children and I will go over the daughters in a little bit more detail when we finish. But really, essentially, just very quickly, all of us should know that the first of the children that was born was Al-Qasim. Al-Qasim. And this is the vast majority opinion. There is a second opinion that Zainab was born before Qasim and so Zainab becomes the eldest and then Qasim. So that opinion is there. But the majority of uh, Mu'arrikhin, of Sira scholars, they say that Al-Qasim was the first child that was born and he was born and he died before the beginning of Islam. And there are two opinions about the age of his death. The first opinion when he's just about to walking, which is going to be two years old. And the second opinion when he's just about riding. And I feel that one of the narrators confused the two. And so it split up at some point in time. Did he say walking or riding? If you say riding, riding a camel, then you're meaning seven years, eight years old. Okay, you're not going to ride a camel alone at the age of three or four. So if you say riding, then he's going to be seven, eight years old. And if you say walking, he's going to be two years old. Allah knows best which report is the more authentic one. Uh, either one, it basically means that he lived beyond you know, the, the years of, 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 of weaning. But Allah knows best. The one that is more mashhur is that he lived to the age when he was riding a camel on his own, which is seven, eight years old. So he's basically a young child, and then he passes away. And here I'm going to go into a quick tangent one of the goals of my seerah and my Ummahat al is to try to cover as many topics as we can that are related to the seerah. And this is a topic that does um, uh, have a relationship and I wasn't able to cover it when I was doing the actual seerah. So just a five minute tangent here about the issue of Qasim and the kunya of Abu Qasim. Okay, because we're talking about Qasim right now and of course Qasim is uh, uh, the son of Khadija as well. So the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Anas ibn Malik said that once we were in Baqi' al-Gharqad, and somebody called out, Ya Abal Qasim. So the Prophet ﷺ turned to look at him. And the man became embarrassed. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't mean you. I meant so and so. 
because you're not supposed to call the Prophet ﷺ by his name. And the man said, Ya Abul Qasim. And the Prophet ﷺ turned and he, I didn't mean you, there's another man, his name was Abul Qasim. I meant him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Use my name. Tasammaw bismi. Wala taknu bi kunyati. And don't use my kunya. You may use my name, but don't use my kunya. This is a famous hadith in Sahih Muslim. Now, based on this, our scholars, as you can imagine, have differed into seven opinions or something. Like that. They love to have all these different opinions to confuse the masses, but maybe there's some benefit that allows us to teach the masses all of this confusion to clear it up for them. I'm um, just kidding. Of course, they're not confusing the masses, but people have to understand. Like when he's saying, La taknu bi kunyati, don't use my kunya. Does that mean it's haram to use his kunya whatsoever? Well, the Zahiris and Imam Shafi'i said it is haram. You cannot, it's the Shafi'i madhab, you cannot use the kunya Abu al-Qasim. It is haram. Another group said, no, it is makru, but it is not haram. A third group said, it is only haram if your name is Muhammad. If your name is not Muhammad, you may call yourself Abu al-Qasim. Okay? So if your name is Muhammad, you cannot choose the kunya Abu al-Qasim. A fourth group said that, in fact, not even just Abu al-Qasim, but you should not even call anybody Qasim. Because if you name them Qasim, what is a person going to call his father? Abu al-Qasim. So he said, even this, take it out. All of these are minority opinions. The vast majority of ulama, and this is the Maliki madhab, the Hanbali madhab, in the Mashhur riwayah, the Hanafi madhab, the vast majority said it is completely halal to call yourself Abu al-Qasim and to name your son Qasim and to be called Abu al-Qasim even if your name is Muhammad. How could they say this when there's an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim? Because they said this hadith number one was given for a reason. And that reason was what? Don't be confused between who the Prophet is Abu al-Qasim and somebody else. Now if anybody right now says, oh Abu al-Qasim, there is no confusion that he means the Prophet so with the death of the Prophet this prohibition is lifted up this is the majority opinion the three that say this and then as partial evidence as well so then they move on to the next piece of evidence and they say as uh, the scholar Rashid Ibn Haf said uh, the tabi'i he was a tabi'i, tabi tabi'i he said I met four of the children of the Sahaba all of whom were named Muhammad and their kunya was Abu al-Qasim. Which means what? The Sahaba themselves understood that this prohibition is no longer applicable after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he lists them. Number one, Muhammad ibn Talha ibn Ubaidillah. We all know Talha ibn Ubaidillah, one of the Ashram of Washara. Number two, the most famous amongst them. And I mentioned his story briefly, but obviously, mashallah, other than our note taker who is currently writing a text, which is all right, uh, everything else is uh, forgotten. By the way, how many people have said to give salam to you over and over again? Um, maybe we should have a surprise cameo at the end, because all over the world people are asking. Even last week somebody said it again, so before I forget. Um, it's, a, it's, it's too much of an honor, he's saying, for the people online. Okay, bismillah. Uh, so we said, uh, number one is um, Talha bin Ubaidillah. He had a son, Muhammad, and he was Abu Qasim. Who is the most famous uh, Muhammad, whose kunya is Abu al-Qasim, who's from the Tabi'un, the sons of the Sahaba. Does anybody remember? A Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was of the famous sons of Abu Bakr, and his kunya was Abu al-Qasim. And there was a Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. That's number two. Number three, you had a Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. You had Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Talib, and he was also Abu al-Qasim. Then number four, you had Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas had a son, Muhammad. Muhammad ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, and he was also Abu al-Qasim. So four of the major sons of the Sahaba, in fact, all of them were Ashram Abu Bashara, they named their sons Muhammad. And their sons then took the kunya Abu al-Qasim, which means they fully understood. Now, why would you take the kunya Abu al-Qasim if your name is Muhammad? Because you want to follow the Prophet ﷺ, correct? There's no other reason to choose Abu al-Qasim if your name is Muhammad. So the sons of the Sahaba understood that this is permissible. And once they understood it, so the majority of scholars then said it is completely uh, permissible. Therefore, to this tangent here, 
you may call somebody Abu Qasim in our times, no problem, even if his name is Muhammad, no problem. That was something that was only fi zaman al nubuwa it is allowed now. So that is Qasim. Then after Qasim, we said there's a controversy who was first, Zainab or Qasim. So those who say Zainab was first, Qasim comes second. Those who say Qasim was first, which is the majority, Zainab comes second. So Zainab is the eldest daughter of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Most likely she was born when he was 30 years old when he was 30 years old. And I'll do the stories of these daughters uh, at the end very quickly again of the seerah. And again, um, to, just to tell you from now, the information we have about them is less than a paragraph or two. They're all concealed and shrouded in the hijab of the seerah. Hardly anything is known about them. So Zainab is the eldest of the daughters and she is the one who is married to Hala's son, her Khala's son. Hala, the one whom Khadija, yani Hala, Hala had a son, Abu al-As, and Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'a. So Zainab is married to Hala. Khadija is the one who put the marriage together. Khadija is the one who asked the Prophet, why don't you marry Zainab to my, my nephew, Abu al-As? And so they married, and they were very, very much a couple who uh, wanted to stay together, who loved one another, and they remained together until they passed away. Their story is very, very famous, and we'll talk about it in detail maybe in a few weeks, inshallah ta'ala, if Allah gives us life, and then we will finish the series. We'll move on to very quickly the daughters and grandchildren of the Prophet even though I've done it before, but just one time in a different way. That Zainab uh, and Abu al-As, um, they, Abu al-As refused to convert to Islam in the beginning. Zainab converts to Islam, but Abu al-As always remains a faithful husband, a loving husband, a very loyal husband, and never harms any Muslims. He's not an enemy to Islam. He doesn't convert for personal reasons of family and whatnot, but he doesn't become an enemy to Islam. And even in the Battle of Badr, he participates grudgingly. He doesn't really get involved in the attacks. He's in the back, but he is captured as a prisoner. Abu al-As is captured as a prisoner. And when the ransom is given, so Zainab then sends the necklace that used to belong to Khadija. Right? This is where it comes into Khadija. That as a part of the ransom, Zainab then sends the necklace that used to belong to Khadija. And the Khadija then gifted it to Zainab on her wedding. And so when the Prophet saw that necklace, okay, obviously this means that when the Sahaba got it, they recognized what it was. They must have taken it to the Prophet because obviously he is not monitoring every single piece that is coming in. But in this particular case, when it came in, so then they must have brought it to him. And so they, they say his heart softened immensely. And you could tell that he is very emotional now. And then he makes shafa'a to the family who owns Abu al-As as a prisoner of war. And basically, anytime the Prophet makes shafa'ah, he is Rasulullah. When you listen to him, Allah will give you back much more than what you, you, know, you have given. So when he makes shafa'ah, any Muslim will do whatever you want, Ya Rasulullah. And so he says, if you feel it is okay, he doesn't want to order or command. If you feel, if you feel that you can find yourselves in your heart to do this, then why don't you send Abu al-As you know, home and give them the, 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 the you know, ghanima back as well. Don't take the, the, the money from them. And there's no question that, you know, we have to be honest. If somebody says, oh, how come the Prophet did it for uh, Zainab and not for the others? We say, because it is Zainab. And what's there surprising? He is the father of Zainab. Zainab does not have the status of any average lady on the street. She is the daughter of the Prophet. Why is that surprising? And this is his you know, wife's jewelry coming. Why is there anything wrong with this? There's a personal element involved, and there's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. So he made a shafa'a for Zainab's uh, jewelry and her husband. And he told Abu al as as we know, that I'll let you go on one condition, and that was why he did it because he did not want his daughter to remain married to a mushrik. So he said, I give you one condition, you go back and you send Zainab here. So you go back, you're free, but essentially your ransom is my daughter, basically. That was basically what it is, right? So Abu al-As, subhanAllah, willingly, yani he, nobody could force him in Makkah. Once he went to Makkah, he could have broken the promise, but that's not his character. He sends Zainab back, uh, Bilal and others were waiting outside and you know Zainab goes with them and he returns back to uh, Medina and so uh, Zainab then remains single and unmarried she could have got married at that time her nikah technically does not exist after the idda is over but the two of them are very much they want to remain a couple even despite all that is going on and finally 
in the sixth or seventh year of the Hijrah in a very famous story mentioned in Sahih Bukhari where uh, uh, Abu al-As basically runs away and he flees and he takes refuge in Medina, enters in the middle of the night and he finds the house of uh, Zainab. How that happened is really interesting. Allah knows how. We don't know. But how he would have found the house in the middle of the night, Allah knows best. He finds the house of Zainab. Nobody knows in all of Medina that Abu al-As is because he's still not a Muslim at this time. He's not supposed to be there. It is illegal for him to be there. He might get into trouble, may even be killed because he is a pagan coming from the Mecca, from Quraysh. He finds the house of Zainab and in Salat al-Fajr when the Prophet says, Allahu Akbar, from the back, the voice of Zainab when Fajr has started, that she said, I am Zainab binti Muhammad and my husband Abu al-As has sought refuge with me and I have given him refuge and given him protection in Salat al-Fajr. Okay? When the Prophet ﷺ finished the Salah, he said, have you heard what I heard? They said, yes. He said, Wallahi, this is the first I'm hearing. Like in other words, don't think that I know something you don't know. It's tense between Quraysh and, and, and the Muslims. It's tense. Don't feel that I, this is some, no. This is the first I'm hearing. My daughter didn't even tell me that she's making a public appeal that I want to protect Abu al-As, you know. And Islamic fiqh says that any Muslim who gives a protection, uh, that protection is valid, okay. A man is called. Any Muslim who gives a protection, that protection is valid. So the Prophet allowed uh, Abu al-As protection, but he did not allow Abu al-As to remain with uh, her unless he converted, and he then converts to Islam at that point in time. And so the marriage resumes. Now there's a long fiqh discussion did it resume? Was there a new nikah? Because they haven't been together for five years. How could he then? They just so that we're going to talk about that later on. But the point is, this is um, Zainab, and uh, Zainab uh, passes away in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The next daughter after Zainab is Ruqayya, and Ruqayya was born when the Prophet was thirty-three years old, and Ruqayya was betrothed to Abu Lahab's eldest son Utba. But she was too young to actually get married. It was just an uh, arrangement and that when they grow older, they will get married. As you know, Abu Lahab reneged and broke away and refused to get his son married to uh, Ruqayya. Both Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum were betrothed to Utba and Utayba. Utba and Utayba are the children of Abu Lahab. So before Islam, the agreement had been made that the marriage will take place between these two daughters and these two sons. Obviously, after Islam, you know what happened and Abu Lahab went against and said, I don't want my sons for you, and uh, that was better for the daughters as well. So they, that was finished. So Ruqayya therefore migrated to Medina as a single lady without getting married. She was also young at the time. So uh, she would have been uh, basically uh, in the 20s or so. So she hasn't gotten married at this stage. And she then, uh, sorry, I'm getting confused. Uh, not Ruqayya. Uh, Umm Kulthum wasn't married. My fault, my fault. My, my slip of the tongue. Umm Kulthum migrated as a single lady. Ruqayya was then married to Uthman. My fault, my problem. Uh, Umm Kulthum was not married when she did Hijrah. And Fatima was not married when they did Hijrah. So to repeat, the two older daughters were married in Mecca. The two younger daughters were married in Medina, that was a slip of the tongue. Ruqayya was married, obviously, to Uthman, obviously, my, my, my mistake. And uh, the two of them, they even had a son, as we talked about, and we will talk about again, inshallah. And uh, Ruqayya uh, migrated to Abyssinia and migrated to Medina. So she is one of the daughters of the Prophet who has done both of the hijras. She has been to Abyssinia and she has been to Medina as well. And Ruqayya was the first of his adult children to die. She died before Zainab. Ruqayya was the first to die, and she died in the Battle of Badr before the Prophet returned. And she was so sick, that was the excuse of Uthman for not going. That was why Uthman was given an excuse to not go, even though he wanted to go. And because of Ruqayya's illness, he was given an excuse. And at that point in time, uh, Ruqayya was then, uh, the, uh, w when she passed away, her sister Umm Kulthum was then uh, given to Uthman radiallahu an. And Umm Kulthum had been previously unmarried. She had migrated as a single lady. She didn't have a husband. She was too young to have a husband at that time. But in Medina, she's now a young lady. And so when Uthman radiallahu an is now eligible and single, so then uh, Umm Kulthum then marries Uthman radiallahu an, and she as well uh, passes away in a few years, and she, they don't have any children. Fatima, as we know, uh, she is uh, born in Mecca, 
and she migrates to uh, Medina as a young girl and she then marries Ali radiallahu an in the second year of the Hijrah in the month of Muharram the second year of the Hijrah and so Ali and Fatima's nikah took, takes place in Medina Fatima was five years older than Aisha and we'll talk about Aisha in two weeks inshallah ta'ala and the last of their children was Abdullah now there's a bit of a controversy if Fatima was number four some say Fatima was number three and Umm Kulthum was number four. There's a bit of a controversy there. And there are very strong reports in both sides, to be honest. So Allah knows best. I just want you to know that some say, and the difference between Fatima and Umm Kulthum is a year and a half. So there's not that much difference. They're very close to each other. Uh, so some say, and to be honest, the family generally seems to say that Fatima was number three of the daughters. And this is in contrast to what we are familiar with, that she was the youngest. Allah knows best. Um, Allah knows best in the end of the day. But what is known, mashhur amongst the Muslims is Fatima was the youngest. And there are some reports that say Fatima was the youngest as well. Uh, Fatima was five years older than Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The last of their children and the only one to be born in Islam is of course Abdullah. It is of course Abdullah and Abdullah is called a tayyib and a tahir and Abdullah is the one who is born in Islam and dies in Islam in Mecca and because of whom Surah Al-Kawthar is revealed and I've mentioned his story many many times. So these are the people in the household of Khadija and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that we understand what is going on in these years about who else is coming in, which families are living there and the children that are born to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now obviously the big narration that we have of Khadija, which is the most important narration, is the narration of Khadija radiallahu anha and what she did when the wahi came down. There is nothing that I found before this except for one narration and Allah knows best how authentic it is because as usual most of the narrations have missing links but it is mentioned. Uh, from uh, Urwa ibn Zubair, from his brother Abdullah ibn Zubair, that a neighbor of Khadija narrates that once he heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raising his voice in the house of Khadija and saying, Ay Khadija, Wallahi la a'budu allata wal uzza, Wallahi la a'buduhum abadan. That he was saying to Khadija, I swear, O Khadija, I will never worship Allah, I will never worship Al Uzza. And Khadija was responding back that Khalilat, Khalil Uzza. Leave Allah alone, leave Uzza alone, meaning don't worry, don't worship them. And what this indicates is just the only thing I found in that 15 year interim between the marriage and the Ghari Hira incident. The only thing that I found is this one thing. And what appears to be happening is that there is some pressure being put by society on the Prophet to participate in some ceremony, to be a part of Allah and Al Uzza. And he's feeling that pressure and he's telling Khadija, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. And Khadija is saying, don't worry, don't do it. Don't leave Allah alone. Don't, don't, don't go to Allah. Don't go to Al-Uzza. And this is before the coming of Islam. So we know the Prophet never worshipped a false god. It seems therefore that after the marriage, Khadija as well stopped doing this. Even though this is before Islam. So Khadija as well then becomes basically a Hanif and she stops worshipping the false um, gods and she supports the decision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to not worship these gods. And this is again uh, what we would expect of Khadija. There are also things that seem to be happening right before Iqra is revealed uh, by just a few months. And of them is that the Prophet Sallallahu is confiding in Khadija that things are changing. So we know from authentic hadith, and I mentioned this in the beginning of the seerah, that the Prophet ﷺ began experiencing different things before revelation began. Of them, the hadith in Sahih Muslim says, for example, there is a hajar in Mecca that used to say salam to me even before I was a prophet. And I still recognize that hajar, that rock, every time I pass by it. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying there is a rock that I remember it used to say salam to me. And I still know which rock that is. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said that sometimes the Prophet would see a light or hear a voice saying salam. And once he confided this to Khadija 
And he said to Khadija, I am worried that something is wrong with me. Some, there's a disease or something. And she was the one who then said to him that Allah will never do this to you, O son of Abdullah, ya ibn Abdullah, Allah will never do this to you. So the Prophet is telling Khadija some things are happening. I don't know what they are. In Abu Naim's book, uh, Dala'il al Nubuwa, it is narrated that the Prophet and Khadija were both in Ghari Hira for an entire month and it happened to coincide with Ramadan. So this shows that at times Hira, Ghari Hira, the Prophet would take Khadija there as well. And they would both worship Allah in a way that we don't know what, what there's no salah, but what would they do? And at one of those occasions, the Prophet went outside the cave and he heard a voice say, Salamu Alaikum to him. And he came back to Khadija and he said, I think I have heard a jinn trying to scare me, trying to do something to me. And she replied, it must be good news, O son of Abdullah, Ya ibn Abdullah. It appears that Khadija would sometimes call the Prophet Ya ibn Abdullah. This is one of those nicknames. So it looks like Khadija would call the Prophet Ya ibn Abdullah, O son of Abdullah. As far as I have read, no other of his wives would do this, none of and that's it makes sense because only Khadija is the one from Mecca who knows, yani, maybe she even has memories of Abdullah. Allah knows best. You know what I'm saying? So she is the only one they're calling Yabna Abdullah or son of Abdullah. This must be good news because salam is only given by the good and for good. If somebody says salam, it's not a shaitan. Okay? So if you're hearing salam, it must be good news. And in another hadith, also in the La'il of Abu Nu'im, uh, so the La'il of Abu Nu'im, last week I quoted the, the, the La'il of Al-Bayhaqi, I said it's the most famous the La'il. The second most famous the La'il is Abu Nu'im. Abu Nu'im al-Sfahani has a multi-volume book about the miracles of the Prophet so It's one of the classical books of miracles. And in that book we have this narration where it says that the Prophet said to Khadija that I am seeing dreams that are coming true. Now that phrase, I'm seeing dreams that are coming true, we know from authentic hadith. Well known. Hadith in Bukhari says the Prophet would see true dreams for six months before Risala. So we know this. What this version is saying is the phrase that he's going to Khadija and confiding in her that I'm seeing dreams, I see something and it comes true. And she responded that Abshir, have good news for nothing will happen to you except good. So all of this shows that even before the Iqra incident happens, the Prophet is confiding in Khadija, going to Khadija. And we're going to see, obviously, in the Iqra incident, it really embodies the relationship and attitude that the Prophet had with uh, Khadija radiallahu anha. Uh, Az-Zuhri, the famous Tabi'i, he said that after the daughters of the Prophet were born, that was when he began to love seclusion. He wanted to be cut away. And that is when he would begin retreating in Ghari Hira. So this is happening basically when the Prophet is in his late 30s. That's when he wants to just, he just for some reason he he's, doesn't want to be around the people of Mecca. And obviously Allah is preparing him for, uh, you know, uh, Hira. And so he would go to Hira for many nights at a time. And he would take food prepared by Khadija. Until when it ran out, he would come back to Mecca do tawaf, then return to Khadija for a few days and then take food again and do the same thing. And he did this for maybe a year, maybe three years until Iqra began. So there's this phrase where he is basically living in Khadija with Khadija and Hira, between Hira and Khadija, between Ghari Hira and the house of Khadija. For a while doing this, for a while doing that. And Khadija is the one uh, helping, providing food. According to some reports, at times she herself would go deliver the food. And this is proven as well in the version of Abu Nu'im, where at times she might even have stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu in the cave. And I want you to, before we move on, SubhanAllah, I mean, I'm not trying to be any, you know, um, mocking or anything of our current situation and men and women relationship. But wallahi, how many wives would support a husband who's doing something this strange? Not that I'm comparing any man to the Prophet But the point that I'm trying to get, can I come across here is that the Prophet is at this stage, he's acting atypical. That's the least that can be said. I mean, some would have said it's a bit bizarre leaving the house going for days in a cave. And Khadija has so much trust that he must be doing something that's beneficial for us. 
And that really is the mantra of Khadija. That's what we see about Khadija, that she gives the utmost respect and trust to her husband. That really was what he needed during this time frame. And we're going to see this over and over again, that the support of a wife for her husband, of course, it is so important. And we see this again, I mean, I don't want to go into a tangent here, but yeah, it is so true, and all of us men, we know this, that your, the, the support of the wife is something that really empowers a man to become more courageous in the, in the work, to become more confident in, in what they do. Psychologically, it's actually empowering. It gives the man the energy that is needed. Not just from you know, the wife, from the family, from everybody there, but especially from the wife. And I know this talk is you know, politically incorrect in our age because people think this is antiquated because we're now talking about how genders are a social construct. Of course, I don't believe that, but people are saying how men and women are the same. Obviously, I don't believe that at all, but you can't change the fitrah. You know, I just want to tell you one book that is one of the most popular bestsellers on Amazon about marriage relationship is by Dr. Um, Emerson Egerichs. Emerson Egerichs. And it has, you know, Amazon has that rating system. It has, I think, 3,000 five-star ratings. I mean, that's like almost unheard of on Amazon. Amazon, as you know, is a platform for everybody, majority of whom are non-Muslim, and they rate books, you know. So a book that has even 100 ratings is a big deal. Most people don't rate a book. You know, I'm saying who's going to rate it? To have 3,000 four and a half to five star ratings, like this is, it's off the charts, as they say. And it is one of the most popular books written by a psychiatrist about a healthy uh, marriage. And the title of the book, I have the book at home, I've read it, I've summarized it in my classes and that I give on, on marital issues and whatnot. And that's why I've discovered the book. I was looking at what are the most popular books out there that are beneficial, and this one always was being referenced and popping up all the time. It was written, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. So now it's antiquated these days. In 15 years, these ideas are considered old school anymore, right? But the title gives it away. The title of the book is love and respect the love that she most desires and the respect that he desperately needs that's the title of the book love and respect you can try your best to say men and women are equal genders are social constructs you cannot change the way that allah created men and women a woman desires to be loved and admired that's the way allah created her she needs to be reminded of that love she wants and craves the love that a man will give her. And in return, obviously, she wants other things as well, just like the man. But the main thing that she wants, what is the main thing the man wants? The book says it. Love and respect. Respect. To be respected means, doesn't mean that you put your husband on a pedestal and bow down to him. That's not what it means, even though the hadith has that connotation. Because there is that connotation there. And I'm not going to mince my words. There's a reason for that connotation. But it doesn't mean that you literally worship the husband. No. But it means that when the wife gives the confidence to the husband that I trust you, that's what the respect is. I trust your judgment. I know what you're doing and you're, what you're doing is going to be work out in our best interest. That support that a loving wife gives, this person, the guy who wrote the book, is saying when the man has that support from a loving wife, it is the most powerful psychological tool that he needs to conquer all of life's problems. Because he will feel empowered that, yes, I have the love and the support of the woman I need the most. I have her support, I can do everything. In contrast, when she doesn't give that support, okay, if she is like making sure that his ego doesn't exist, okay, always putting him down, mocking him, the person is going to feel, if I can't even earn the trust of my wife, how can I earn the trust of anybody else? And even though he won't say that, right? But that's what, the, by the way, I'm just quoting the author here, right? Even though us men, we know this is true, but this is what the author is saying. And again, uh, it's Dr. Emerson Egerichs. I do re recommend you read the book. But the point that he's saying is that the man doesn't even realize this, but it's in his mind. He's a psychiatrist. He's a world-famous guy. What he's saying is, the man subconsciously, if he has failed his marriage, then he kind of sort of thinks he'll fail at everything else as well. Whereas when the, even though he doesn't say that, but that's there. And that's why depression is linked to marriage so often. Both husband and wife, by the way, both of them. 
There's so much to do with, with that. Now anyway, but the story I'm trying to come to with Khadija is that what we see in Khadija throughout all of the narrations, you know, and again, all of our mothers, we love them, we respect them. The ones that will appear in Medina, we hear certain minor things that are human nature, nothing wrong with that. Certain grumbling, certain complaints, certain bickering, human nature, and they are the best of us. What I'm trying to st say with Khadija, not even a whiff of any of this. Nothing. It's a totally different lady. And what we learn from this is the level of support that Khadija gave to the Prophet ﷺ. It is unparalleled and that is why he himself said وسلم, so many years later that she supported me when nobody else did. That's what he remembered about her. What was the phrase that come to his, came to his mind, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That she supported me. So the support of a loving wife, that, that, that is what helps a man overcome so many uh, things. And so when we look now at the story of Ghari Hira, everything will now fit into place. Once you have this psychological framework, because really this is the most important story of Khadija in the Meccan era, that so many books mention, and that is, of course, the incident of Jibreel coming to the process of Ghari Hira, squeezing him three times. We all know that story. According to Ibn Hisham, the Prophet went back to Khadija, and this is in Ibn Hisham's version. Bukhari doesn't have this one, but it's a very interesting phrase. He says that he sat next to her thigh to thigh, means he literally is next to her and embraced her. So he needs a physical comfort. Now, you know what happened, the squeezing and all that. You know the, I'm not going to go over the Ghada Hira. I mean, that's, everybody knows that. So jumping over that, I'm now coming back to, back in the house of Khadija, right? So you understand what I'm, what I'm saying here. Time is limited. We're not going to go over all of that. So he comes back and embraces Khadija. This is a very interesting, you know, phrase that it understood that he needs to be comforted. And he embraces Khadija. According to the Bukhari narrative, his heart was palpitating. His heart is now trembling and whatnot. And he's saying, Zambiluni, Zambiluni, as he enters the house. And Khadija then comforts him. Aisha says, Hatta dhahaba anhu rawa. Now, Aisha's version does not mention the embrace, and you understand why psychologically she wouldn't mention that one phrase. Understanding, even though. Obviously, you get the point here that she's not going to mention. There's mention in other narrations here. But Aisha does mention that until his trepidation and fear left him. Now, what truly amazes me when I think about this is that from Ghari Hira to the house in the middle of Mecca, minimum, minimum of two hours. In our times, with staircases to Ghari Hira, you have a staircase now, okay? And you have well-paved roads. In our times, I don't think we can do it in an hour and a half. Less than that. And even that, I think we're being generous. Minimum is two hours, if not more than that. To go down from Ghari Hira and walk and go all the way back to the house of Khadija next to the Kaaba. Throughout those two hours, whatever has happened in Hira, our Prophet is still feeling cold. You know, all of us, once in a while something happens and we go cold. Whether it's the news of somebody, whether it's whatever, we go cold like that. But how long does it last? Five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes, ten seconds? How long does it last? Whatever happened to the Prophet ﷺ, like Ibn Hazm said about another matter, that if any of us had had it, we have had a heart attack immediately. The very fact that he's still alive and breathing, it shows a level way above us. But at this stage, two hours, and he feels the, tr the, 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 the cold. And he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. Think about that. Khadija covers him up. Now again, he embraces her. The narration doesn't say, but it's understood. What do you think she would have done? What any wife would do. That's human nature. Obviously, these awkward details, especially the classical arus, wouldn't have mentioned it. But what do you think any wife does when her husband is feeling scared, trepidation? She must have hugged him back. And think about that. 
two hours of walking does not comfort him what two minutes of Khadija's embrace does. Just think about that. Once, as Aisha says, then when his fear was lifted up. So it took a while from two hours. Now that Khadija's there, they embrace and hug. He cover, she covers him with the shawl and whatnot. Now the fear goes away. And now he's able to talk. Subhanallah. This shows us the love that the Prophet had and the comfort that he found in uh, Khadija. And he then confides with her that in the akhsha ala nafsi. That's what the hadith in Bukhari says. I'm worried about myself. Means, and this is something that many Muslims find awkward to say, but I don't have any issues with exactly what is there. He doesn't know what's happening, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's wondering, am I seeing things? Am I delusional? These are things that are happening. What would any person do if he's hearing voices, seeing light, seeing something? I'm worried about myself. What is going on? In the akhsha ala nafsi. I'm worried about what is going on. And this is another amazing reality. Again, the men here fully understand. Fully understand. This is human nature. Men build walls. That's what we do. We're not talking about the wall the good guy in the White House is building. That We're talking about the walls that we built around people. Men build walls. They do not allow anybody in to their innermost thoughts. When men come together, they talk about external problems, the politics, the world, this and that. They don't talk about a problem happening at home. It's embarrassing for a man to tell others about a weakness. That's not what a man talks about. But... If there is a confidant, which is for most men non-existent, if there's somebody that you can really open up to, that person you will open up to. And when a man does that, highly vulnerable, very difficult for a man to put himself in a position of laying out his weaknesses. Who does a man do this in front of? Somebody whom they have utmost trust. It's very difficult. And that's our mother Khadija. No man likes to tell even his wife that I have this problem. Because he feels as if he's not a man enough. You know, this is a problem we have, I'll be honest. It's a male ego problem. We don't want to, that's, you know, women, mashallah, tabarakallah, they can talk about any and all problems, real and imaginary, for hours and hours on end, mashallah, tabarakallah, good for them. But women, men, on the other hand, they don't talk about their problems. On the contrary, they just clamp up on it. They don't talk to anybody. Sometimes even their family, they're nobody. They just clamp up on it and they just deal with it internally. When you open up, it's a sign of vulnerability for the man. And it's a sign that the person I'm opening up to, I have full confidence in. And frankly, most men might not have anybody in their lives or maybe one or two people like that. Here we have the Prophet ﷺ opening up to Khadija, telling him, telling her, his doubts, his fears, his weaknesses. I'm worried, what am I seeing? And once again, I mean again, I'm not trying to astaghfirullah mock any modern couples or whatnot, but a lot of times if any man does that, the response to his wife is even more demeaning. Okay? Like anytime a man comes and says something problematic that might be, it's like, well, you would deserve it, you should have gotten anyway, you know? Well, you shouldn't have done that. You know, that's like also a very common response. And obviously when that happens, then the man's ego, which is already fragile, goes to, you know, non-existent, which is why he clamps up even more later on. Okay. But again, subhanAllah, what we have here, wallahi, I mean, this is mind boggling. I wish somebody with a speciality in psychology and psychiatry analyzes this next paragraph. I can only do so much. It's not my expertise. But wallahi, what we see here is a woman with psychological wisdom and emotional maturity, the likes of which is hardly existent. I mean, look at how she deals with the situation. Here is her husband coming to her terrified, trembling, vulnerable, with a very bizarre story. And she comforts him in such a manner that she takes that fear, that trepidation, and turns it over into confidence. What an amazing lady. And in Sahih al-Bukhari, we have six phrases mentioned. 
and in other books we have other phrases mentioned. I'm going to add all of them together. And so let's piece together that conversation to the best of our ability. In Sahih Bukhari, we have six phrases. The first of them, لا والله لا يخزيك الله أبدا. That's how she begins. When she, he comes and says, I'm scared, I'm worried. He's, he's laid open his vulnerability, put it all on the table. This is the most vulnerable a man can be to confide in someone about their weaknesses, especially a weakness to do with your body, with your mental issues is definitely a very big weakness. And immediately, with the voice of confidence, Khadija negates those doubts. No, that's not true. No, nothing wrong with you. La wallahi, swears by Allah. Then she affirms, she negates anything can be wrong. Then she affirms, La yukhzik Allahu abada. Allah will never, ever embarrass you. Allah is not going to embarrass you by putting you through those. It's a negation of his doubts and an affirmation of his status. And then begins a long list of CV resume snippets. Okay, this is a list of the positives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And once again, not to, I mean, you know, I'm sure this doesn't happen to any of us men here. We have never, there are stories that we hear about in faraway places, right? Where sometimes a woman might list the negatives of her husband rather than the positives. Have you heard of this ever? It might be something, stories, right? Here and there, right? Nothing, nothing we have ever experienced in our lives. But perhaps it is said in faraway civilizations that if a man might open up, the wife begins to demean even more and bring up things of 10 years ago. Again, these are things said, not that I have any experience of this, but it is said that something might be brought up of 10, 15 years ago. Here we have Khadija radiallahu anha, subhanallah. And again, wallahi, look at the emotional maturity. To bring up the positives at a time of weakness. Wallahi, think about that in all seriousness. He is now feeling scared and vulnerable. And Khadija doesn't remember the negatives. Oh, you did this that day. Oh, of course. He's not along. No. She has confidence boosters, one after the other. In Sahih Bukhari, five things are mentioned. In Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad, there are three other things. And in uh, At Tabari, we have one other thing mentioned. So, a total of nine things that we find in various narrations. And this is so beautiful, and subhanAllah, and I, I'm not trying to, astaghfirullah, brag about anything, but I don't think anybody has done this type of thing before, to, because I was very interested in this paragraph. And I wanted to go and see, so I actually collected it. And, ju- and I don't want to you know, sound like this, but just to make you understand, these five minutes that you're going to hear took me an hour and a half to do. It's not that easy. Much of the research that goes on is something that behind the scenes is something that I, alhamdulillah, I enjoy doing that. But I'm saying this is not something that is immediately accessible. And I don't know anybody who has actually gone and tried to find out what did Khadija say and tried to figure out the whole, you know, piece it all together. Because it's mentioned in, you know, five or six different books. In Sahih Bukhari, we have five positive things that are mentioned. Ibn Sa'ad mentions three more, Al-Tabari mentions one, and then Al-Bayhaqi's Dala'il mentions uh, an ending to this. So we have a, a nice long paragraph that is found in the multiple sources. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody has constructed it in this manner. And if somebody has, then any, alhamdulillah, I don't know anybody's done that. So let's begin with Sahih Bukhari. Five things are mentioned. After the first point, the first point we said is what? Kalla wallahi la yughzik Allahu abada. In Sahih Bukhari, number one. Number one, inna kala tasilu rahim. So Khadija is now describing the positives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are good to your family and relatives. This is the first thing that she mentions. You're good to your family and relatives. You have Silatul Rahim. Number two, you help the weak. You help the weak. Those that are weak, oppressed, you help them. Number three, you give to the one who has nothing. Somebody that's impoverished, no food, no clothes, you give to that person. So the second, so the first issue is about your family. The second issue is about social work, being involved in the community, taking on the causes that are unpopular, whether it is the issue of burying the daughters alive, whether it is the issue of racism, whatever it might be at that time, you are helping the oppressed. Number three, you are giving to those that have nothing. So this is now charity, generosity. 
Number four, تُقْرِ ضيف. You are hospitable to guests. If a stranger comes, doesn't have a roof, you invite them over, you let them stay in our house. You're hospitable to guests. You give them food. And number five, وَتُعِينُ عَلَى جَمِيعِ نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ That is like an end-all, be-all. Like it's a generic statement. You help in every positive manner that you can. It's just to end. Like I can't even list all the good that you have. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى جَمِيعِ نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ you help in every good cause that is there. Just leave it at that. So this paragraph summarizes for us the life of the Prophet in Mecca. What is he doing in Mecca? Here Khadija summarizes those positive things. You're a loving father. You're a good tribesman to your local tribe here. You're somebody who takes on the causes of those who are oppressed. You're somebody who's generous with their time and their wealth. You're somebody who's hospitable to strangers. You give them food. You give them our shelter. You're somebody who helps in all good deeds. In the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, there are other phrases that are mentioned in on top of these ones. Three are mentioned in, in the Tabaqat. You speak always the truth. We know this, al Amin. So your manners and speech are always the truth, number one. Number two, your amanat are always fulfilled. If somebody trusts you with anything, a promise, a contract, an item, you have given them an oath, you always fulfill it. And number three in, in Sa'ad we have, and your akhlaq are the most akram, the best of the akhlaq. There's nobody better akhlaq than you. In the tarikh of At-Tabari, we have an extra phrase, and that is, you have never done any fahisha. You've never done any bad deed, drinking, gambling, women. You haven't done any of that. So all of these, if you look at them, subhanAllah, what is Khadija saying here? Khadija is saying you're a good man. You're an honorable man. You're a decent man. This shows multiple things. First and foremost, and I've said this in many khutbas, if your spouse can testify to your character, you don't need any other character witnesses. If your spouse can truthfully and honestly testify that he is a good man, she is a good lady, because nobody knows you better than your spouse. It is very easy to fool your colleagues at work. It is the norm to have a double life outside and inside the house. Very easy. Many are the people, their masjid friends think they are angels and their families know they are devils. Many are the people, wal'iyadu billah. But when your spouse can testify honestly and truthfully that he is a good person or she is a good lady, khalas, that testimony is all you need. And that is why Khadija's testimony is worth the weight of a thousand men. She's testifying to the akhlaq inside the household. And what does she mention? Anything that is positive is mentioned here. Look at this long list of 9, 10 points. You can't even think of anything more. Number two, we have over here as well, Khadija's positive understanding of Allah Azza wa Jal blessing the good person. That Allah will bless the good. So what I'm saying here is before even Iman comes down from the heavens, Khadija already has a type of Iman in Allah. This is a very important point. Before the details of Iman are revealed, Khadija already has the precursors of Iman. It's amazing. Because she has so much essentially thiqa billah, al husn al dhan billah, al tawakkul ala Allah, all of this is gushing out. And she hasn't even heard la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah yet. But it's her fitrah. So this shows the purity of Khadija radiallahu anha that she knows that Allah will bless the one who's righteous and I don't know anybody more righteous than you O Muhammad O Ibn Abdullah at this stage not Rasulullah at this stage. So what we see here truly is a psychological wisdom and an emotional maturity that is mind-boggling mind-boggling, where she takes the fear of the Prophet ﷺ and she turns it into confidence. And then, to add to that wisdom, 
she then suggests a course of action and then she takes the hand of the Prophet and walks with him on that action. Wallahi, what a lady. Think about this. Not only does she suggest what is to be done, she physically, she could have just said, go to Waraqah. She could have said that. Go to Waraqah, see what he has to say. But she knows right now he needs a little bit of help. And my physically being with him will comfort him. So she accompanies the Prophet ﷺ to Waraqah ibn Nawfal. And then the story, as you know, Waraqah explains what has happened. And Waraqah, of course, is a cousin. As we said, that Nawfal is the brother of uh, Khuwaylid. So Khadija bint Khuwaylid and Nawfal, uh, Waraqah ibn Nawfal. Nawfal and Khuwaylid are both brothers. So this is her brother's uh, son. And Waraqa is elder to Khadija by many, many decades. At this point, has already become blind, etc., etc. And this really, again, illustrates, as we said, the maturity of Khadija. And I want to translate for you a beautiful passage from, straight from Ibn Hisham. Right after this incident of Ibn Hisham's uh, Ghari Hira, right after Ghari Hira, Ibn Hisham has a paragraph about Khadija. And I found it interesting. He put that paragraph at Ghari Hira, not at the death of Khadija. What does the paragraph say? I translated it for you. And Khadija bint Khuwaylid believed in him and affirmed what had been sent to him by Allah. And she supported him in his affairs. And she was the first who ever believed in Allah and his messenger and believed in what was revealed to him. Uh, in other words, she is the first Muslimah in human history. She is the first to embrace Islam. We're going to come back to this point next week. Ibn Hisham goes on. Ibn Ishaq. Sorry, this is Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, same thing. Ibn Ishaq. So this is being written 130 years after the death of the process. A very early paragraph here. So, th so through th her, through her, Allah made it easy upon his prophet. Never would he hear anything of his people rejecting him or refuting him and become with grief Except that that grief and worry would be removed when he returned to her. For she would comfort him and affirm him and make it easy for him. And thus make the troubles that the people gave him, she would make it disappear and easy for him. This is Ibn Ishaq writing, the first author of Sirah. He has this beautiful paragraph that Allah blessed the Prophet with Khadija. And with Khadija's help, he took on the problems of the world. This is basically human psychology here. That never was any problem being faced outside, except that he would return home, and she would change that grief and into comfort, and that fear and worry into confidence. This is Ibn Ishaq writing 1,100 years ago. And of the blessings of Khadija, and time is up, so we'll just finish off with this one thing and then we'll move, um, wait till next week, inshallah. Of the blessings of Khadija, obviously, not only has she been the first to accept Islam, she is therefore also the first human being ever to do wudu and pray of the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one of the ummah, obviously the Prophet did, no one of the ummah prayed and did wudu before Khadija radiallahu anha. And Ibn Abd al-Barr uh, says, she was the first to believe in Allah and the Prophet. Ibn al-Athir says, the first of all of khalqillah to accept Islam. All of Allah's creation to accept Islam is Khadija. Ibn Athir writes, no man or woman preceded Khadija. She is the first person to embrace Islam. And as Zarqani, the famous uh, uh, author of hadith says, as Zarqani says, she was the first to believe and pray. So she started this practice of accepting Islam and praying. Uh, she started the sunnah of prayer. So she will get the reward of all of those who did this deed until judgment day. In other words, what he's saying, the hadith of the Prophet whoever begins a good deed shall have the rewards of all those who follow until judgment day. Az-Zarqani is saying she's the first person who began the good deed of embracing Islam. No one before her embraced Islam. She's the first embraced Islam. The Prophet is a Nabi. She's the first who embraces Islam, converts to Islam basically. So everybody who converts, their role model is Khadija whether they know it or not. And she's the first to do wudu and pray of the Ummah. So everybody is then following Khadija 
in this, that she's the first person who saw the process of wudu and she then did it. First person who saw the process and pray and then she did it. And beautiful hadith over here in the Mu'jam Al-Kabir of Al-Tabarani. And because it was long, I decided to just read the Arabic instead of translating it. Volume 10, page 183. We have here that Ibn Mas'ud says, the first time that I heard about the matter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is Ibn Mas'ud. You know Ibn Mas'ud. You all know Ibn Mas'ud. And he, he is describing how did he hear of Islam. The first time I heard of Islam was when some of my uncles came to Mecca and we all went to Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. They were the friends of Abbas ibn Mas'ud's uncles and Abbas were basically traders and whatnot. Remember Ibn Mas'ud was an Arab, he wasn't a slave, but he was from what is considered to be a lower class of Arabs. He was an Arab, he was not a slave. And he was a hired hand, he would do menial chores and jobs and do other things. So he was living in Mecca and he was basically a, a worker, basically a laborer in Mecca. And that's why there was this class warfare between Abu Jahl and him. But he was not a slave. And so Ibn Mas'ud said, my uncles came and they were sitting with Al-Abbas. And we were sitting around the well of Zamzam. Then when we were sitting there, they saw a man come uh, and he describes their seeing of the Prophet Sallallahu like, uh, you know, a, a, a whitish man with reddish tinge. Now, when the Arabs said white, they meant light brown. Remember, when the Arabs say white, they don't mean white. When they say white, they mean lightish brown. White for them was called yellow. Okay, what we call white, they call yellow. For them, when they said a whitish man, it is light brown, creamish, brownish. That's how the complexion of the process was. And he had hair going to his uh, uh, ears and uh, his uh, forelock was large and his nose was uh, you know beautifully fashioned all of this there full beard etc etc uh, this is in the narration here you all understand this he is like the moon on the full moon and this is in the narration here and on his right hand side was a handsome young man who was not yet bearded young man and behind them was a lady who had covered herself completely. This was rare. They didn't see a lady who covered herself. And they came towards the Kaaba and they touched the black stone. They did tawaf seven times and the boy on his right and the lady behind. Then they raised their hands and said the takbir. The boy was on his right, the lady behind them. They raised their hands and they stayed there for a long time. Then they did rukur and stayed for a long time. Then they stood up and they stayed for a long time. And then they went into sajda and the, lay, the boy on his right and the lady behind. And they did all of this throughout the entire time. So we had never seen anything like this before. And we found this strange. So they turned to Abbas, his uncles, and they said, O oh, Abu al-Fadl, what is this new ritual that we have never seen? Has something happened? What is going on here? So they, he said, don't you know? They said, no. He said, that is my nephew, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And the boy to his right is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the lady behind him is Khadija binti Khuwaylid. Ama wallahi, there is no one on this earth who worships Allah in this manner other than those three. Only these three are worshiping, that's it. These were the first people who prayed, and they were the first to do wudu, and they were the first to face the qibla. No one preceded them before this. So everybody who then does these deeds is in fact imitating Khadija radiallahu anha. She is the one who started all of this in the uh, ummah, and so she will get the reward partially of all of those who did it until Judgment Day. And this leads us to the conclusion of today. And inshallah, next Wednesday, bi ta'ala, we will conclude Khadija binti Khwalid. We'll leave questions to then, inshallah, because it makes sense to leave it to then. And with that, inshallah, we'll see you next week, bi ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.